Okay, uh, now we're back and week four of the Domain Specific Languages of Mathematics course, lecture one, part five. Make your own type class. So remember we were talking about the data type for integer expressions with only the three constructors, add, mul, and con. And we had implemented a rather higher order function, eva2, also known as fold. Um, it takes three arguments, add, mul, and con, and basically replaces capital add with lowercase add, capital mul with lowercase mul, and capital con with lowercase con. So now we want to see if we can make functions of this um, style into a type class um, members. So let's define a type class and call it int exp. So a type A is something for which we can define integer expressions if we have a mul or a, take it all order an add. So that's an A to A to A. If we have a mul of the same type and if we have a con from integer well, let's uh, just write i to a because we had a type synonym so remember before i was talking about type classes now we have introduced a type class with no members so far so if i try to do add well adds of uh, con 0 and con 1 it would just say no instance because there are no instances so far Okay, so let's provide at least one instance. And we had an instance, the, the sort of natural instance is for integers. So in instance int exp, what could be a better inter, integer and expression than an integer? Integer. Well, how do I do that? Well, I need to provide a, a definition for add. I need to provide an expression for mul and I need to provide an expression for con. And we in practice already know what these things should be. But first let's just check the types. So when we've said that add should have this type a to a to a and then we said we want an instance where a is equal to integer, that means that whatever we put here should have type integer to integer to integer. And that's also what the uh, right hand side says. The whole underscore has this type. Okay. So things which would fit there are, for example, normal addition. So let's provide whoops, normal integer addition. And then, not surprisingly, this is supposed to be normal uh, integer multiplication and a constant. Well, then we need to transform an integer into an integer. Well, that's easy. That's the identity function. <clears throat> so, okay, reload and try the same expression again. So add con 0, con 1 is 1. So let's um, introduce some examples here. We have a few from before, which we can sort of, let's just move these. Um, Maybe I should first say that at this point, now we have one type in the set of instances. And now we have made sort of general versions of the, con of the E1 to E4 we had before. So now they're not actual syntactic expressions. They are generic sort of type class parameterized expression. So notice that the type here is A, if A is an index. So currently, one could say, well, we can solve that. We know it's just one type, it's a set of integers. So these expressions could just as well be written as integers directly with normal integer addition and integer multiplication. But the type is general, and that's because we could provide more instances, and we will. So let's try S1, S2, S3, S4. These are normal integers. What the, checking the type, 
they have this gener type which says that, well, if you provide me an instance, I will provide you with a value of that type. So we had another instance implicitly above, and that when we did the deep copy. Uh, so deep copy is corresponds to the instance here with IE. So here we're saying that IE is also a kind of integer expression. And then add is capital add, mal is capital mal, and con is capital con. So, well, I guess this should be, now we have two types in the set of instances. Okay, it means that these S1 and S2 and so on, they are defaulting to integers, but they could be something else. So if, for example, if you require this to be an IE, then it's a CON1. If we require S4 to be an IE, it's this multiplication expression. So notice that we have written these expressions using the type class methods CON, ADD, and MUL. And they sort of, what did you say, they, they are, uh, they're waiting for a meaning. So they're sort of a little bit like they have a fold built into them. So they want to become a value of some specific type, but they haven't yet. Okay, uh, so we had integer and IE as instances, uh, but we could also add something completely different, uh, like booleans. So we had int exp bool. Where? Well, actually, it's not very far-fetched. We said that we could do addition by, well, actually, maybe I get help from, uh, if I load this one, uh, what was it called? Uh, even add. So even add, and then I can guess that mul is even mul, and that con equals even con. Oops. Okay, so that type checks. Now we have three instances, and we can try now to claim that S4 is actually a Boolean. Well, that Boolean turns out to be false. So what's going on here behind the scenes is that when we send in, when we have a type of this shape, when there is a context and then the A, this is sort of morally equal to, these are basically the same thing as a higher order function. So it's a function uh, of the same style as this function. So it has these three extra parameters. Uh, now it should be A instead of B, so I'll have to rename it. Uh, B by A. So when Haskell internally handles a class constraint, the easiest way of explaining is to say that, well, actually, it replaces uh, this int exp a arrow with a, actually a record containing these three things. So there are three arguments hidden, uh, which are then helping to compute this. So depending on what type you give it, when you say that S4 has type integer, then it knows which collection of methods it should look for. So uh, then we know that it's this first instance. If it's an IE, it's the second. If it's a bool, it's the third. And you can keep playing with this. Uh, you can make an instance for string, which could do showing. And you can make an instance for different other types as well. Uh, what you cannot do is make two different instances for the same type. If you want to do that, you will have to use a new type. Anyway, so now we have a class and we can define these sort of generic values. And then let's draw, do one more version of the evaluator. So let's copy the definition of EVA2, because I said that EVA2 was basically um, sort of the, what Haskell semantically meant with this kind of expression. So let's, instead of these three arguments, write the type class constraint. So this is now int exp. Well, if, if we should make it the same kind of type as before, it should be A. Uh, and then it can't be called EVA2 anymore, so let's call it EVA IE 
for EVA integer expression. And now it should not have three arguments because the three arguments are hidden in this type class context here. And then, well, uh, as, as you, we, we can still keep the definition here, I think, yes, it type checks, but the three arguments now don't come from explicit calls to EVA, i.e. they come from, um, from the implicit arguments instead, but they're still used here. So let's see, what can we use EVA IE for? So as we see, it's type, uh, well, we, we can test it. So test, uh, test one is of type IE to IE. Well, uh, let's, let's do it in the order we had before. So test I for integer is IE to IE and test I is just equal to EVA IE. Okay, so then test I applied to, well, an IE expression, we could have uh, mal con one con two, it's, it's two. Uh, it's, it takes a syntactic expression and then interprets it depending on the type, but in this case, we specialize this to the integers. Uh, we could also do the test uh, for IE, integer expression syntax trees and we could do it for bool we have those instances in place so notice um, that i've defined here the same well sorry i didn't mean to go away there um, i've defined three different functions to be equal to the same expression but behind the scenes given the type information haskell will supply the different type class instances which I should scroll up slightly to see, uh, so that these three functions actually turn out to be specialized to these different types. Um, and this, this is something which is actually uh, a typical example, which is used in most of the, of the exams. So if you are interested in actually passing the course, you should perhaps look at this closely and make a few examples uh, mimicking this. Okay, uh, maybe we should test one of these functions, so one or more of these functions. So test IE, that's the boring one, which takes a, uh, well, let's apply it to the first examples, four, E3, for example. Uh, and then test B is just calling the third variant. Uh, we should note that, that EVA IE takes a syntax tree as an expression, so we can also use it with these S1 to S3. So what happens there? Uh, let's let's take this as the last example here to test B1 equals test B applied to, or maybe I should call it test B3 then, test B applied to S3. So first let's check the types. So uh, test B3 here is actually, uh, as it's a, it's a Boolean. And why is it Boolean? Well, the S3 expression, which is generic, let's keep that in the scope there, the type. Um, when it sees that test B needs an IE as an input, it sort of becomes, or Haskell supplies the instance for the, the syntax tree. So S3 sort of, this evaluates to test B of, well, S3 where instead of add, it says add. S1, S2, which is then equal to test B of add of, well, in S1 in turn is instead of little con, it's big con, uh, one and then con two and so on. So this is uh, now has shown, if we zoom out a bit, um, in, in, in general, first we define the data type IE, then we define the evaluator EVA from IE to int, then we generalized it to EVA2, which I will splice in the type of just for completeness here, where it takes, whoops, it takes all of these three things as arguments. Uh, and then we made the class 
int exp, which mimics the three uh, parameters needed. And then finally, we defined the eva ie, this version of int exp. So uh, we sort of, well, let's put these together and, and compare them. So in all cases, we end up with a function from IE to something. And this last two are basically equivalent. This is the one where we explicitly, EVA2 is the one where we explicitly, sort of explicitly supply the semantic functions. And this is the implicitly uh implicitly supply the semantic functions through an instance declaration so this is not not sort of generic uh fixed to the semantic type i equals integer and these two are generic generic version one and generic version two okay so that's the overview uh, in many cases where you have a data type for syntax tree so this is a syntax part of a dsl uh, you can also have corresponding uh, type class, which mimics, well, uh, sort of collecting the fold parameters. And I should also at that point be a little more clear with what I call a fold, generic version one. So this is fold generic version one and this is old generic version two so i take the the specific uh, which could be as an instance of fold and then i make two versions of the generic fold which can be used uh, to apply to to evaluate the expression to different syntaxes and uh, good exercise exercise i don't have to comment it uh, make an instance I int exp string which implements pretty printing IES. So basically converting a syntactic syntax tree to a string and so on. Okay that was all for lecture one the fifth part and um, next is uh, exercises.